Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the June edition of our first Friday lecture. My name is Dave Kelly, and I work in the advancement office at the university. Uh, today's topic is Fisher in Rochester. Uh, Fisher has enjoyed a mutually beneficial relationship with the Rochester community since, it, since its inception. In the early days, the community came together to financially support the institution's founding. And over the decades, Fisher has supported the Rochester community in numerous ways and made an indelible impact on the region. Here today to tell us a little bit more about that connection is Dr. Carolyn Baca. Dr. Baca is a professor and chair of our history department and interim chair of our criminology and criminal justice program. She's also a well-regarded expert in the history of the greater Rochester region, and she serves as the official historian for Monroe County. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Baca. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, for those of you who have been around, well, Dr. Munch, you get the record for being around. <laughs> um, but I was just saying, I when I started these um, a long time ago, we used to be in Cleary, and then I did one across the road in Murphy. Um, and then um, this room was completely different. So when I walked in here today, it was reorienting myself, right? But it's always such a pleasure to meet with this group. I admire your um, interest and loyalty and involvement with St. John Fisher College. It's thanks to people like you that I have the opportunity to teach and to study and to work with um, our amazing students. I tell everybody, one of the things that's the nicest about being at Fisher is that we have nice students. They are really, they are really nice people. And so that makes it a pleasure to come in every day. I do wanna say before I start that I will be mentioning some specific alums in the course of this talk, not because they are my favorites or they're the most impressive or anything else, but because it will give us a, a sense of the array of things that our alums do. And so I wouldn't want anybody to feel overlooked or disregarded. And as I've said, I think you're all great just for being here. It's terrific. So um, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, all hazy. I, you know, it, it's just, um, that was the property where we are um, when it was seen. So the fabric of the Rochester community and that of St. John Fisher are tightly interwoven, which makes pulling separate threads from it difficult. From its earliest beginnings, the university has shaped and influenced the Rochester community, and in turn has responded to the needs and changes in that community. And that basically is the lens through which I would like to look at this today. It was kind of a daunting topic when um, President Rooney said, why don't you do Fisher and Rochester? And initially I said, oh yeah, sure. And then I realized, hmm, maybe it's not quite as snappy as I thought. Um, so that will be my particular lens. Through its alumni, programs, and leadership, it has made real its founding goals and enlarged its place in the public arena. To illuminate the facets of this complex relationship, we need to return to the post-World War II era in Rochester. And I do have to digress here, just one moment. I didn't know that I was gonna to get to see my good friend Cindy today, but her father-in-law is at Normandy today, yeah. today to celebrate the anniversary of the landing and he is 97? Yes. 97. So 
And he very kindly speaks to my students about his experiences. He was at the Battle of the Bulge. He liberated a concentration camp. He has a range of information and he, um, it's so moving to listen to him. If that one is on Facebook, um, the group is the Best Defense Foundation and you can follow um, all of their adventures over the next couple of days and all of the uh, veterans basically from the United States and uh, England and France will be there who actually served in World War II. Oh, yeah. What was, the, what was the name of the group? Best yeah. uh, Defense yeah. Foundation. Thank you. So yeah, it, and it's amazing. And one of my favorite stories about Jack, he lets me call him Jack. <laughs> we call him Jumping Jack. That's, that's okay. Um, is that he takes other veterans on honor flights and shepherds them along. And I just find that you go 97 and you're taking care of other veterans. Yeah, well, you know? So yes, a digression, but I think it was well deserved. I'll let him bless you. Thank you. Um, the end of the European war, back to our topic, and then Japan's surrender touched off wild celebrations in the streets of Rochester. As many as 50,000 people swarmed downtown streets, shouting, cheering, blowing on horns, hanging on, banging on tin pans and ash cans in an ear splitting celebration. But even before BJ Day, there was unease and concern about the future. The termination of war contracts, which hit this area quite hard, and the return to peacetime production had set in motion a massive re relocation of the workforce. The capacity for business and industry to convert to peacetime production was unknown, and immediate labor trends were alarming to some. Some sense of this was revealed in a September 13, 1945, Democrat and Chronicle article relating that there had been about 18,000 layoffs in Rochester. And then, keep in mind, this is just September, 1945, due to war contract terminations of which about 5,000 employees had found other work. At least 8,000 were receiving or applying for unemployment insurance. And yet, 5,300 new peacetime jobs were going unfilled. Why? The article cited several mental and economic hangovers that were impeding the transition. Peacetime take-home pay was lower than wartime wages, which had often included considerable overtime. Hundreds of weary war workers were simply taking a deserved rest, enjoying real vacations for the first time in four years, fully intending to return to work afterwards. Business and industry were more selective, hiring only those who already had the best skills and training, whereas under war pressure, almost anyone could land any job of some sort. Unaccounted for were another 5,000 displaced workers. We now know that mostly they were the wives and mothers who took war jobs to help out and did not plan to continue in industry after victory and were not welcome to continue either. Plus children who returned to school. Added to all of this was the growing number of returning veterans armed with the GI Bill and looking to make up for lost time. In time, Rochester would report one of the highest percentages of returning veterans in the country. You know that song, how you're gonna keep them down on the farm after they've, well, apparently those who were from Rochester didn't care about gay parity. They were very happy to come back home to Rochester. Um, and so we had a record number compared to cities across the country of returning veterans 
which put a lot of stress um, across the board in society. It was a wonderful thing, but it also had some pretty um, taxing consequences. One veteran's personal recollection highlights the conflicts many war veterans were trying to reconcile. He wrote, I drove up to the entrance of Rochester Products Division three or four times during the summer of 1945 and parked outside. I looked at the place and couldn't go back in. I was not sure why. When he returned to Rochester after flying those 35 bombing missions, he was supposed to report back to Rochester Products within 90 days. And eventually he did. But still, he couldn't shake the feeling he didn't belong there. Finally, he went to the personnel department to give notice. When asked why, he replied, I don't like what I'm doing. And when I look around, I see older people doing things I don't want to do at that age. Those tense, harrowing moments enduring flak and enemy flight fire, fighters over the Plusty oil fields had changed him and his attitude toward work. His experiences on that bomber had tested him, made him more confident, made him realize he had leadership abilities. All of a sudden, the assembly line was not so appealing to him. The personnel department referred him to the training department, where fortunately the person he talked to had been one of his teachers at West High School. The former teacher suggested that he take some classes in electrical engineering. The next day he was sitting at Mechanics Institute in a three-year program that led him to attend classes in two month blocks, then return to Rochester Products to work in various departments. Eventually, he became a senior product engineer, supervising more than 30 engineers and technicians. I fully enjoyed my career once I found out what it was. For this war worker serviceman, like so many others, World War II meant something more than participating in a great crusade to defeat the enemy. It had been a personal odyssey. It was the turning point in his life. So what does this have to do with Fisher? Well, in this milieu, we have Father Hafey and Bishop Carney come forward with a message of hope and progress. They shared a vision for young men. Many younger brothers or sons of servicemen, many the offspring of immigrants, most of whom would find their pursuit of a liberal arts education rather than trades training, which there, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, but many of them wanted to pursue a true liberal arts education. <clears throat> Tampered by uh, other educational institutions, admissions policies and costs, which affected them greatly. Building on the success of Aquinas Institute, and energizing a successful fundraising campaign, Hafey and Carney celebrated their success with a groundbreaking on June 19th, 1949. So from 46 to 49, this vision grew, a dream became reality. Um, well, you can see what was here. You can see Carney in the distance there. Um, the significance of this um, was not lost on the rest of the Rochester community. Their fundraising was so successful uh, for two reasons. One was they had an incredible woman who managed all of it, Zelda Lyons, who then became the first registrar at the college here. But she was amazing. Um, and the other reason was that they had so many corporate sponsors. They reached out to corporations who were looking for an educated workforce and knew that they would be able to provide it based on what they saw coming out of Aquinas. Even Eastman Kodak, recognizing the increasing demand for an educated workforce, joined in to support the institution 
with a $60,000 donation, which was quite sizable at that time. <laughs> and there's construction underway. You remember? I stood out there and watched it go on. As I said, Don's been with us. <laughs> my, my classmate Denzel Fury is here somewhere, but he probably saw it too. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> in addition to focusing on the bright spots in the future, Father Hafey achieved what few others have been able to. This is my view. He brought the West Side and the East Side together by locating the college across the county from Aquinas. The instinct would have been to put it right with it and even at the time, they talked about calling it Aquinas College. But um, they understood very well. They were way ahead of their time in understanding that um, they needed a foot on each side of the river in this educational project they were developing. The site selection and construction involved almost every agency and parish in the county. More construction. And by the way, Father Hafey chose that brick. And that's the brick that you see all around sure. on our campus. And when he chose it, it was, of course, more expensive mm -hmm. than red brick. But he was very clear on the fact that he didn't want any of that red brick stuff. The College on the Hill, as we were called, uh, thanks to Bishop Kearney, welcomed 110 students, and along with the spire on Kearney, the construction of a legacy began, one committed to the democratization of education, and that's key. Um, there were other institutions of education in Rochester at this time, but none of them were committed to making sure that the sons of immigrants and the people who were not wealthy had access to a college education. Now, part of that was informed by the whole undergirding of the GI Bill, which really said that. But before World War II, college education was really for the elite. And this institution was created out of exactly the opposite that college education should be available, accessible to all. Well, all men. <laughs> I'm not gonna say all men. <laughs> all men. <laughs> we can only go so far. They were people of their time. <laughs> One of those pioneer class members, history major, which I'm very proud of, he was, you knew him, right? Yeah. Still do. Yeah. Yeah. He's my neighbor now. Yeah. Um, history major Jack Palvino can be seen as representative of the whole of that pioneer class. His experience at Fisher strengthened his resolve to select a career in broadcast journalism rather than the law. And his parents were quite insistent that he was going to go into the law. He actually went to law school and then left. He acted upon his loyalty to this institution by mentoring others, serving for many years on the board of trustees and establishing a scholarship that aids two communication journalism students each year. In turn, the college recognized his service and created the Jack Palvino Communication Journalism Hall of Fame in his honor. Um, and so it just highlights, again, this influence in the community. And he was on, well, I remember him on WBF, and he, but he was also on WVOR, which was a vet's station. Um, and his commitment to the community, his joy in his work, and then also coming back here to respect the, the qualities that a Fisher education gave him. 
As the decades passed, the college continued to reflect on its mission and goals. Identifying needs and opportunities in the community and then began to transition professional departments into separate schools that could focus on content and practice excellence. So we begin to see the structure that we have today emerge where the College of Arts and Sciences provides the liberal arts education, but each of the professional schools offers um, excellence and practice and experiential learning. Well, you can get that in arts and sciences too, but um, these decisions always took into account the shifts in the local economy and the pressures in certain fields. So very important, they were not necessarily donor driven or driven by the latest article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, they were driven by an assessment of the real needs of this community and what programs would successfully serve those needs. For example, as early as 1977, the need for nurses in our community was critical. Just think about that all the way back to 1977, we were dealing with a nursing shortage. Fisher reached out to partner with Alfred University Nursing Program um, so that they could get something going quickly. Um, it that they then created their signature program in 1991. A gift from Robert Wegman facilitated the construction of the school in 2006. Following in the long tradition of creating accessibility for many, Fisher launched the online RN to BS program in 2012. And I was very involved with that. And um, it was wonderful. It gave working nurses the opportunity to get their Bachelor of Science online so that they could still take care of their families, do their jobs. Um, and it fulfilled what they knew they were going to have to have as a state credential down the road. The school now offers graduate programs, including a master's in nursing, a master's in mental health counseling, and a doctor of nursing practice, as well as four new online master's programs, serving a variety of populations. This reflects the commitment to reaching all people in need of health care. And this commitment also led to a very unique partnership well, unique, it can't be very unique. Um, the Golisano Institute for Developmental Disability Nursing, a really one-of-a-kind venture. Um, St. John Fisher College, Wegman School of Nursing, and the University of Rochester Medical Center, Division of Transitional Care Medicine Complex Care Center, joined together, and our own Diane Cooney Minor, former dean, um, was instrumental in this to create this program to address a real need in our community. You know, we have the highest um, number of deaf people percentage-wise living in our community. And it's important that healthcare professionals know that they have certain needs and that those are different and that they also can't necessarily voice their needs as well. So that's just one example. Um, So the success of the Wegman School of Nursing is really, um, it's phenomenal. It is um, one third of our undergraduate students come here for that. Um, it's highly competitive. Um, the students do very well on their um, accreditation exams. And it is a big service to this community as well because we provide healthcare professionals and mental health care. The mental health care program is not a research program, it is a practical program, which is quite different. So our graduates go right in directly into service. So um, I love this picture. <laughs> Fisher's presence in, 
in the health of society is deeply rooted in the Brazilian tradition and continually looks to respond to the growing challenges of providing care for a diverse population. This presence expanded in 2005 with a gift from Robert Wegman for the School of Pharmacy. Of course, these changes were possible only because of a significant investment in the pursuit of the sciences. The original Scalney Science Center was greatly enhanced with the construction of the integrated Science and Health Sciences Building, which opened in the fall of 2015 as an extension to the original home. The building features laboratories and collaborative learning spaces and a two-story living wall emphasizes the building status as Fisher's first U.S. Green Building Council LEED certified structure. Fisher dedicated the Killian and Caroline F. Schmidt Physical Chemistry Lab in 2015 and the Loss Family Research Laboratory in 2017. Um, so the Loss Family also sponsors a wonderful lecture here. So once again, you can see that this was responding to needs in the community. Everybody recognizes him, right? <laughs> <laughs> Businessman and sport executive Ralph Wilson understood the need for teachers in all the districts and provided for the construction of a new school of education in 2006. Fisher educated teachers demonstrate an excellent passage rate on the New York State Teachers Competency Exam and an admirable reputation. Their placement is a significant contribution to the future of the area and to building an educated citizenry. The respect for diversity, equity, and inclusion permeates every one of the programs from childhood education, inclusive childhood education, through adolescent education, inclusive adolescent education. So our healthcare presence, as, as our education presence is expanding, our healthcare presence is as well. It, it expanded in 2005, along with the nursing school, with another gift from Robert Wegman for the School of Pharmacy. Once again, Fisher responded to an urgent need in the community for pharmacists. New York was one of the few states that still mandated a licensed pharmacist to be present when any medications were being uh, dispensed. In many states, you can use a farm tech, but New York has maintained that law. And so that puts a lot of pressure on um, pharmacies and, and stores to make sure that they've got, especially when some of the stores went to 24 hour, that they've got um, a licensed pharmacist there. The PharmD program offers practical excellence and the opportunity to pursue the, the degree online reinforces the accessibility theme. The Interprofessional Simulation Center opened in 2022, which brings together the schools of nursing and pharmacy to work together and it offers a high level of professional training. Um, so very innovative as well. I had to put that up there because it's the Bloomberg picker that's going across. And I think that's cool. <laughs> I know some people are kind of blase about it around here, but <laughs> I think it's cool. In 2013, Fisher graduate and board chair, Victor Salerno, created a new home for the business programs, long known for their excellence in accounting and management. The Victor E. Salerno Center for American Enterprise is home to Fisher School of Business, and it has continued to ge generate day one ready professionals through strong experiential learning. Um, 
And that continues today. They have expanded into the online world as well. Again, increasing accessibility. Um, they offer a master's that is online. Um, again, trying to be aware of the working professionals and what their needs are in our community. Now, this next may not be a need, but it, it sure is fun. Um, <laughs> it's a need for some. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so since 2000, St. John Fisher has been home to the Buffalo Bills NFL summer training camp. And this has been um, a storied partnership um, valued by both sides. Um, and it brings value to our community. It's another summer event that energizes the community. It has really brought um, Fisher to, you know, um, the attention of many people, just as the PGA last weekend brought Rochester to the attention of many people because the coverage was so wonderful about Rochester, even when it rained all day. <laughs> Very nice about it. Um, so it, it also provides great work experience for our students. Our students are priority hires at this camp and um, those in sports management get a taste of doing some things. Others in, in, in other um, fields get to, you know, stock shirts and hats and other things, but they also get to meet the players, interact with them. Um, and the community gets to meet them as well, which is a great advantage. And I remember when then President Don Bain um, said to me, I was chair of faculty assembly, and he said, well, I went down there the other day because we have to have another field if they're going to come back. And everybody told me we couldn't do it. But I went down there and measured the other day. And if we get rid of the tennis courts, we can do it. <laughs> and that was always, I always said, Don Bain would chase Moby Dick in a dinghy if he thought it was going to be a good thing for Fisher. Um, and so um, this has been a great partnership and we are definitely looking forward to another season of Bill's training camp and engaging with the players and enjoying their presence. So while all of this growth may appear haphazard, it was always undergirded by the institution's shared obligation to meet the needs of students and the larger society. So what have our alumni done in this community? I'm gonna go through several right now. Um, according to LinkedIn, which I admit is not exactly a scholarly source, but you know, it has 24,000 546 St. John Fisher alumni members. Not bad. Um, and so where do they work? Well, um, Rochester Regional Health, this picture, 1.84% works there. Wegmans, 1.81%. University of Rochester Medical Center, 1.6%, paychecks, 1.2, and on. So it gives you a sense of the, the significant presence of St. John Fisher alumni in a variety of our leading employers here in the community. Um, I'll mention just a few other alum, um, Russ Brandon, um, sports executive, um, and for a while he was on the board, he is not now, and current president of the XFL. Rich Cristiano, film director, producer, writer. <laughs> Maria Sino, public servant and political operative of the Republican Party. Richard C. David, former mayor of Binghamton. Mark C. Johns, former member of the New York State Assembly. Dan Kane, news reporter and investigative journalist for the Raleigh, North Carolina newspaper, The News and Observer. 
David Larimer, senior United States district judge, federal judge. Jamie Romeo, who I actually had as a student, um, former member of the New York State Assembly and current Monroe County clerk. Edward Staff, billionaire businessman who was chairman and chief executive officer of Dick's Sporting Goods from 1984 to 2021. He is the son of the Dick's Sporting Goods founder, Richard Dick Stack. <coughs> Paul Harrington Hewitt, um, an American basketball coach. He played here for Fisher and the former head coach at Georgia Institute of Technology and George Mason University. Um, and he also was on the board. Marie Therese Tiger Brill. Um, you know, they list her as a beauty queen, model teacher, but you know, she's a businesswoman who created an, an amazing business and um, deserves credit for that. I, you know, I, I mean, I know she was a beauty queen, a model. Well, she grew up in Pittsburgh and she won the titles Miss New York USA in 1978 while she was a student here at Fisher. And then she then she won Miss USA. Um, and again, she was later a model. Again. She opened her own modeling agency in 1987. And um, she currently trains and represents many models, but she also works a lot with um, building self-confidence, a whole array of skills for women. Robert Augustinelli, co-founder of the private equity firm, The Roan Group, and founding member of the Friends of Israel Initiative. And as I mentioned, Vic Salerno, um, and I mentioned him again because um, in addition to his generosity to Fisher, as you can see, um, he's spurred a lot of other philanthropic <laughs> donations throughout the community. Um, then there's um, Lauren Dixon, Dixon Schwabel, and um, the um, Ferdinand J and his brother from J Advertising, who, well, it's now more than advertising, who both are graduates mm -hmm. from here. And so again, in these things, you see the, the um, activities of alumni um, like Augustinelli, who formed a group, Friends of Israel, um, but time and again, we see that they participate in the community in a way that brings that Brazilian motto to life. Um, in 2015, St. John Fisher applied for and received the prestigious Carnegie Community Engagement Classification from the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the New England Resource Center for Higher Education. Um, this is in direct response to all of the work that we have done in engaging the community, giving back to the community, and specifically having our students engage in that. This culture that permeates the institution flourishes in every element. This is reflected in the desire among students to be good citizens and give to the Rochester community. Service scholars, and this is one of our service scholars, contribute 100 hours their freshman year, and then for the next three years, they contribute 200 hours of service, um, making real differences in our neighborhoods. And they generally build on their service experiences. Um, so for example, some of the other ways that students give back, we have a regular program in chemistry where students do go into a neighborhood and do lead testing. Um, they test water, they test soil um, to see um, what is the presence. As we know, many of our city neighborhoods, many of the city pipes are still lead pipes and many of our city neighborhoods are at risk. And those children are at risk for having um, <clears throat> lead affect their brain development. So, it's a wonderful contribution to the community to just go into these neighborhoods and do the testing. 
Um, I have a group of students that I, I had one um, this past summer, uh, past spring, um, the Camino Santiago, in, it starts in Spain and, and goes through France. And um, it has shown to be effective in helping our veterans, any veterans with PTSD. But of course, how many veterans have the money or the time can get released from their jobs to go walk for six months, uh, six weeks, excuse me, six months, was, six weeks was bad enough. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I have students who look at the, the essence of what the Camino brings to veterans in that experience and then recreate trails in our area. So this was a six hour trail that they created along the Erie Canal and other areas. And then they walked it with some veterans that we have worked with. Um, I'm in the process, I have my third NEH grant now to do some of this work with veterans. Um, and so um, again, this is a Saturday and they're, they're walking with these veterans who didn't want to be photographed. Um, some of them are in Eagle Star Housing. You might have heard of that, um, which helps homeless veterans transition. But of course, homeless veterans are homeless for a reason. Um, so it's programs like this that highlight the commitment that our students have to the community. And I think no program highlights that more than Teddy, which we are known for. Um, the annual Teddy Dance for Love, in case you don't know, if you haven't heard, is a 24-hour dance marathon. It was started by Lou Butino, a poli sci prof here in 1983, and it benefits Camp Good Days and Special Times. Sometimes the project funds a trip to Florida for the children. Sometimes it's used for other special things for them. It's raised well over a million. This year we raised 133,000 for it. Um, and I just wanna read a quote from Teddy 32 um, Chair Jenny Keeler. One of the main reasons I chose Fisher was because of the Teddy Dance for Love. No school that I had toured had something as unique as Teddy. And my Fisher tour guide could not stop talking about how wonderful it was. She was right. I joined the committee as a freshman and dragged some of my friends with me. I ended up being the only one who stuck with it, and I'm so glad I did. I volunteered at Camp Good Days for the first time after my freshman year. It was the most fantastic, emotional, and tiring week in my entire life. I fell in love with the camp, the volunteers and the campers and continue to go back every summer. The fact that the Teddy Dance for Love supports something as great as Camp Good Days makes every single hour, minute and second of the 24 hour dance so special. I can't even begin to describe how lucky I am to have Teddy in my life. And I can't wait to experience another amazing 24 hours this year. My favorite part of Teddy is toward the end here of the 24 hours when everyone linked together in a circle. This is my favorite part, not because it's the end of the dance, but because you could be standing next to someone who was a complete stranger at the beginning of the dance. But in that moment, it's like, you're the best of friends. It's so crazy how much the dance brings people together. And I think that's a perfect statement of, why I said at the beginning, our students are so nice. They come here making some of these choices because they know what they will find at Fisher. That's just a cool picture. So this has uh, only been a, a brief highlight of all that Fisher has meant to Rochester and its environment. I'm sure some of the information wasn't new to you but I hope you saw it in the different perspective of how this evolved and what we have been building 
here, and I can say we, because I've been here over 20 years, not as long as Don, but over 20 years. Um, and as we move forward, we continue to find ways to make our surroundings stronger and better, and to follow that motto, teach me goodness, discipline, and knowledge. Thank you so much for being such an attentive audience. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if I'll have an answer, but. <laughs> uh, you're very thorough. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank very you. Very thank you for inviting me. Today, very informative presentation. Just a couple of things for you go. One, um, there is a mass up in the Hermats family chapel at noon. Uh, for those who want to attend. And second of all, I found out today is National Donut Day. So if you haven't had a donut or if you want another donut, feel free to take one. Well, really Thank you all for coming today. Enjoy this beautiful weather. Thank you. Nice to meet you.